Oh, sorry, there's like a notification thing. Um, so I really think that it's um, really about the passion that each student can bring. Um, and also once they um, like understand that the impact they've had is, is an impact, whether big or small, um, they can sort of understand how they can grow from just one thing and sort of um, have other opportunities stem from just the one um, project or volunteering act that they did. Um, and I also wanted to share um, a story about um, one way that I got involved in elementary school. So in um, like in 2015 and 2016, before the 2016 elections, um, I went door knocking with the guidance of responsible adults um, and helped increase voter registration within the state of Iowa, which is where I used to live. Um, and this is when I was only about like seven years old. And for me, I think it really taught me, you know, even at such a young age, you can still um, do something if you have a lot of passion and you understand um, how much just your act. Thank you, Anissa. Did you finish? Did you say everything you had to say? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Amy, what about you? Are there stories of success or anecdotes you'd like to share or just general thoughts on that question? Yeah, so I, I think many of the things that have already been mentioned are really important. I work primarily with kids between the ages of seven and 12. And what I see, um, as Lana said, is like the creativity and the fun, the optimism, as Kim mentioned. Um, and I also see that this is a really uh, important time for empathy. And so empathy rates around these age groups is really high as is a sense of injustice. So like life is not fair is like the branded term of this age group. And I just think that is a really big opportunity to tap into that and say life isn't fair. So what can we do about it? Like how can we make life more fair for others? So I actually see that this age group and why we work with this age group is it's just like an optimal time where the peak kind of optimism and awareness and openness is for all of these important civic lesson, like civic learning experiences. So it feels to me like it's an important starting point. I also would say that I think it's an important time because kids carry so much right now. And when we think of it more from a well being perspective, this is a way to apply that. So if we miss engaging younger kids, we miss working with kids who really are carrying a lot of the burden. Um, and so it's a, it's a well-being piece. And I also think this is a highly influential age. So the recycling movement, um, if you if there's advocacy posters, if, if it's been written by an eight-year-old, you're probably a lot more likely to stop and try to figure out what it it's about. Um, so adults are predisposed to like respond to this age, which I think is very powerful. Boy, I love all of those answers. We've heard about passion. We've heard about empathy. Uh, Amy, what you said about well-being really resonates with me. You know, I happened to attend a Quaker school, which had sort of service as the heart of so much of what was talked about. At the Civic Circle, we don't use the term serve. Uh, we use the term join to connote helping others because it's a little bit more approachable. I think sometimes service has nuances that younger kids may not grasp. But one thing about service or helping others is that you feel good. It makes you feel good. We talk so much about mental health with young kids and how they're suffering and they're struggling. And we don't often go to maybe the most obvious and easiest way to help people feel good, which is for them to go out and do something good for someone else who isn't feeling good themselves. So uh, that's a really great observation and I appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm gonna come back to you in a second with second question, Amy, but I, I wanna just chime in with my own story and answer to this question which is about some students at a civic club we're piloting at an elementary school called Weller Road. And we like to start service learning by asking students, what do you care about? We have this whole My Values worksheet and, and they identify concerns and things they care about. And these students identified animals and animal welfare. So they did a service learning project whereby they collected supplies for animals at a particular shelter, and they wrote thank you notes to the workers of the shelter. But it didn't end there. 
And it became the entree to the next piece, which was actual civic learning and engagement, because the shelter humane education head gave them a virtual tour of the shelter and then came to the classroom and talked to them about animal welfare advocacy. And here are the bills that can protect animals. And here are the steps you can take to advocate for these bills. So it was a wonderful example to me of how service learning you know, can be an entree to a larger um, kind of engagement um, and the, the sort of a stepping stone. So we've talked about the success stories, but what are the challenges? You know, what we don't want is for them to just do a craft project and not realize that there's more to it than just making a teddy bear. How do we make service learning really meaningful uh, and for them? And are there things that can be hard for them to understand or things that make it hard to engage them? Amy, why don't you start this time? So I think that the interesting um, facts that we've learned directly from kids is that adults are part of the problem. So we pre and post all of the kids participating. And one of the questions we asked last time was, what are, what are, what's your biggest obstacle for doing more in your community? And number one by far was adults don't listen. Um, and which was very sad. Um, and as a parent of younger, like of children, it's like, I do listen. But um, I think it's really important to just recognize that that's what they're saying. So I think it's both adults don't listen, but I also think adults have a preconceived idea of what kids need at this age group. And it tends to stand, stay on a pretty superficial level as if kids can't handle it. So I think as adults, we need to challenge our own understanding of the depths at which kids can talk about things and handle things. And canned food drives and um, money jars, and th there are certain tactics that we typically use, um, but kids can handle a lot more. And one of the kids um, was talking about how kids are often like, I'm really, it's unfair that adults think our lives are so easy and that this is like, we don't really understand the hard stuff. And she said, when I was three, my parents got divorced when, and then my dog died and now my dad has cancer. So you think I don't understand struggle? And it, so I just think we need to meet kids where they are and do better job of that. Great answer. You know, Kim, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this because I recall you're telling me that some of what you have done in Howard County is adapt existing materials for younger students, which is frankly something we do a lot at the Civic Circle too. Uh, talk about that a little bit if you would, and maybe that can capture some of the challenge, which is that there aren't a whole lot of supports and resources when you start to work with younger kids. And I think you just, <clears throat> excuse me, you just hit the nail on the head with resources. Um, I find that lots of teachers are open and willing and excited about the idea of engaging and inspiring and empowering our students. However, they either don't know how to go about doing it. They're busy planning for their tested subjects of math and reading. This is in the elementary especially. Or um, they don't feel like they're supported by their administration in doing these kinds of projects. And so those different things with the resources and the time and the constraints that they're put on and then the support, if we don't have those three things for them, it teachers tend to go, well, and this is where as adults we go, well, we can. And this is where very much like I see myself like the teacher for the teachers, right? So my job is to help as a supervisor I need to get out of their way. I need to get behind them. I need to help push them and navigate them through those different obstacles. So for resources, I need to create the resources. I need to give them the lessons, the supplemental materials, the book lists, the, the idea lists. I need to give that to them because I know they don't have the time to create it on their own. Then what I need to do is I need to say, all right, this is the start, but you have full permission to change this, to make it your own, to go off of it, go bigger, go deeper, go wider, go whatever you want to do. And sometimes it's okay for a year when you just, it's COVID, okay? COVID happens. Your project might shrink this year. You might not do as much as you thought you were going to, and you might be living more in the hypothetical because they can't get out of the, of the house, let alone the classroom. Right. So 
I think that those resources, um, being very mindful of the reality. Yes, I love the book you guys are holding up. Um, that is, you know, and then just supporting them. And that's where, and I saw Evie's here too. You know, it's um, supervisors like ourselves who have to convince the school-based administrators that this is what is going to make the impact on the test scores, actually. This is what getting students engaged and getting students um, to actually have to have authentic learning experiences is what will increase their test scores because they will want to read the harder text. They will be excited about diving into um, nonfiction, authentic text that is above their grade level. We keep saying, oh, that's above their grade level. They can't read it. Well, there, where there's a will, there's a way. And you know what? Those kids that we're saying can't read this because it's above their grade level or whatever, those stupid video game instruction manuals are written on an adult level. And yet every kid you find, I'm telling you what, if there's an instruction manual that tells them how to do a modification for Minecraft, they're reading it. They will find a way to read that because they want to know how to do that modification. The same thing happens here. If we give them an opportunity to make a project that they want reality, they will read through the government website, they will figure out what it is they need, and they will make it happen. We just have to get out of their way and get behind them and help push. Yeah, great Sorry, answer. So <laughs> oh, so, so true. And, you know, what you're reminding me of is something that I read by someone who said, essentially, when it comes to civic learning writ large, we are asking and expecting far too little of students. And I agree 100%. Um, so Anissa, what about challenges in your world in middle school or for what you remember from elementary school? Uh, we've heard from the grownups how students are saying that adults and parents are the obstacle. Was that your experience? What can you tell us about that? Um, I think for me, like I, I sort of knew like ways that I could get involved, even though I was really young, um, from also seeing my sister, she's older than me, um, seeing her having set up um, other, you know, fundraisers. Um, but I think like for a lot of students, it's like just not knowing where to start and not understanding that there are these organizations like the Civic Circle um, to, you know, help you in what you want to do and to also recognize like what can be the most beneficial for your community or, you know, where you live. Um, and then also like at such a young age, I think it can be hard to like grasp the importance of civic education and like understanding your impact. So I think that can also be a main thing. But like what, like about what was saying earlier, I think it can be like hard for, I don't know, like I think students understand like they have the potential to, you know, make an impact. It's just like finding a place that will like help them the most and allow them to do the most good that they can at a young age um, is really like the main barrier other than what was that. Thank you so much, Anissa. Was that what you wanted to say or did you have anything to add? No, okay. yeah, that, that was me. Yeah, was... okay, great, great, thank you. Um, Lana, what obstacles did you run into and how did you overcome them? Yeah, well, I kind of building off of what everyone else has said about like these barriers that are in place that prevent kids from doing as much as they could. I think one thing that, kids really want to see is the results of their service you know if you're just like making 10 sandwiches and then they just you drop them off and poof they disappear that doesn't really show you the family that is eating tonight that you helped and so trying to make it so that kids can really directly see the people that they're helping or i guess in some cases like the animals they've helped or the trees that they've planted um, is really helpful for showing them the real impact that they can make, um, which then gives them more confidence to go for even bigger and better things. 
Um, and I, unfortunately, a lot of things like have age restrictions for the people that can be there, but I still think that we can, if we focus on making sure that the kids really get to see what they've done, um, that'll be a big motivator uh, and keep them interested in continuing their service and civic participation. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's a great segue to one of the questions on my list. And one thing I wanna ask is, how can we make sure, especially with younger students, that it's, well, and even middle school too, that it's not about checking a box. You know, we know that Maryland has this wonderful requirement for graduation of service learning. And there's a danger that we, are, I think, are all too aware of that, you know, teachers and administrators get busy. They're like, oh my gosh, we've got to do this. So we're going to have a mass event in the gym and everyone's going to bag groceries and then they're going to go home. And, you know, there's a lot more to it than that as far as, um, the learning opportunity, uh, which as you've pointed out, Lana, includes not only seeing the result of what you did, but also exploring what might come next. So how can we make these really meaningful uh, opportunities? And uh, why don't we start in the middle today or this time with Kim? Uh, how do we ensure that it's uh, kind of the full arc, if you see what I mean? You know, not just doing the service learning activity, but exploring uh, the bigger questions behind it. Uh, like, well, what would we have to do to not have hungry people in our county, for example? So I think that that's where we give students a strategy. Um, so with ours, um, with the program that we have, we took Project Citizen, which was a eighth grade um, Center for Civic Education program. And we wanted to see it done at a lower grade. So we chose third grade, which some people are like, well, that's pretty low. Well, we thought it was actually the prime opportunity for them. And just as you were saying, in order to make sure that whole arc happens, we needed to give them a way to analyze the problem to see if it was worthy of truly delving into it and to, to start thinking about what would be necessary in order to make this feasible. And so um, in Project Citizen, they have something called, um, uh, well, it, they have, it's four things. They say you should look at the scope, intensity, resources, and the duration, right? And so what we did, because we were like, kids are never going to be able to remember scope, intensity, resource, duration, right? Like that's just, eh. So we created a character named Sir D. And we had a graphic designer create this like knight, you know, with a civic shield. And he's on all of our resources. And so Sir D is how they remember scope, intensity, resource, duration. And then we teach them, what does that mean? Like the scope of the project. Let's think, pie, and we start with pie in the sky. Like how big can, do we want this? Like, well, what's the problem? How big does the solution need to be? If it's a big problem, it probably needs a big solution, right? Well, what could it be? And then you go, okay, well, of that big solution, do we want to start, where could we start, right? And so we look at that. Um, and then when we think about the scope, we also say, okay, so what will it look like at the end? You know, once we're, how will we know we're done? What will the prop, what will have happened to the problem? Like, um, cause they need to know like, well, all right. Um, so realistically, if the problem is the Chesapeake Bay being polluted, like, do we want to say there will be no pollution? You know, do we want to say there will be less by this amount? Do we want to say this kind of pollution? Like, what are we talking about? How will we know we've met our goal? right? So setting it down for them. Um, and then that kind of overlaps with intensity as far as thinking about, you know, just how big, of the, how big is that problem? And then the resources, okay, what do we need to make this happen? Who do we go to? Not, well, I would need an adult would have to do this, a so-and-so would have, to, no, it's okay. We've got to get buy-in from this person. We've got to get buy-in from this. Let's, all right, how can we do that? Who can write the letter? Who can, and they're so good with technology now. So instead of just sending the letter that's from the eighth grader or eight year old and letting them read, we're gonna send them a video, you know, a little video of them pleading so you can see their cute little faces, right? Going, I believe in this and I hope you believe in me too. And who can say no to that when there's a video of a little kid with big eyes, you know, those puppy dog eyes. You're like, help me, help me help you. You know, you're like, okay. 
what do I got to do here, kid? Uh, I'm going to make this happen. Um, so, and then we think about, okay, it, it's probably going to be an ongoing project, but let's start. What do we do now? Right. And so we start the project um, with them in third grade so that we can continue to encourage them with it in fourth and fifth. So we don't want it to die, um, as you guys were saying, and especially Lana had alluded to it earlier, you know, they, they need to see the results. You know, had you never seen with your um, business or with your project, had you never seen um, the results of you creating those really cool crafts, um, I don't know that you would have kept doing it and then gone bigger. You know, you had to see like, people need immediate gratification. They need to see and feel like, okay, I did this part. And I saw this happen because of it. So, okay, let me keep going. You know, we need reinforcement. And so reinforcing the students along the way through third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade um, is what we have to do as teachers. And so we can do that by starting young. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. I just went on a huge tangent. No, you, you did very much so. And I love hearing all about it. It really resonates with me. You know, Amy, you are good at the Giving Square at making sure that students see results. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you do that and also about how, as we've said, we can ensure that it's not just checking a box or doing something that, you know, students think, oh, great, I made a craft, that they see the connection and can take it into a larger civic engagement uh, portal. So I think the biggest risk of not doing that and having it kind of stay as a check the box is apathy. And while there's some really interesting research out of the University of Kent that says that while most younger kids have been engaged in service, only 20% can tell you what it was for. And if that's the case, if that's how kids experience service, that's a problem. And I think Lana said this well when she mentioned that kids need to see the results, like we need to find a way to make it, make it meaningful. So the two, I would say two of the, the biggest things that we do is really start with broadening our understanding of all of the different ways that kids can contribute and kids don't typically have money as an asset themselves. So thinking about the ways they can use their brain, their heart, their ears, um, we really try to validate all of the, the skills that kids naturally have and bridge that with, with contributing to community. The other thing is really giving kids a foundation. So we, the exercise that we do through our program is that it's a kid advised fund where kids are given the responsibility to give away $1,000 at the end of the program to a local kid serving organization. They are not the fundraisers. They are, we tell them you are being given this responsibility because you're a kid. You know what it's like to be a kid. You um, know your community and you're putting in the hard work. But prior to that action and that experiential learning moment, we spend a lot of time doing two things. One is kind of popping every kid's bubble so they can see the world around them and have a sense of lived experiences outside of their own. Um, and then the second thing is really figuring out pathways for kids to humanize issues. So hunger isn't just like the kids in Africa are starving and that's why you need to eat your peas. Like there are kids in your school, they're like hunger is this, it feels this way. So we do a lot around personal narrative and connecting around the stories of others so that prior to doing any action, it's humanized and kids can relate to it because we really believe that we wanna teach that we all give, we all receive. It's not like the giver is here and the recipient is someone to be pitied, but we're all kind of in this together. And so that's why the humanization of social issues is a foundational piece of what we do. Wow, thank you so much. I'm glad this is being recorded because I'm gonna go back and listen to everything. Kim, you have your hand up. Oh, I, I caught what Amy was saying and I thought, wait a second, is this, are you for real? There's a program that gives kids a thousand dollars? Like I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, we're so, like, how many of Let's those awards do you give? So we, we have 26 schools and 43 programs in those 26 schools. So how do I get one of my schools to be one of your schools? I will talk to you after. Let's chat. <laughs> oh my God. I am so excited because think about it, like from a financial literacy standpoint too, like oh. this is, yeah, like totally Oh my gosh, the possibilities, my brain is exploding. <laughs> and I would love I'm to go to Howard. Right so like, 
Oh, Hi, Ted. <laughs> I came on today thinking that I was going to give back, like, and get give ideas, but you just gave me so many. This is awesome. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Thank you both so much. So uh, let's see. Lana, did you speak on this question yet? I don't think so. Not quite. Uh, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, no, I just, I think we were exploring how we can make it something other than just you're, you'd create the craft or you check the box, but you don't then have a service, a, a civic learning opportunity that emerges from it. In other words, to me, the real gateway is we do the service learning activity, but we also reflect upon it and we ask ourselves, how could we get at the root problem that, that is caused, causing this issue? Um, Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're right now we're more on just the service side. We are trying to um, really just get food out to these families. But one thing that we've been trying to do is involve um, local like officials in our distributions, like inviting different people out to raise awareness within like the government um, and try to inspire some civic change that way. Um, and more towards the point of like, keep making sure it's not just checking one box, like you do your two hours and you're done. Um, we really encourage the kids to try to make it fun and make it habitual. Um, if you bring your friends, it's just hanging out for a couple hours doing something and you're much more likely to want to come back and really stick to it um, and see a wider impact um, and how you can change the world over time. Um, and then also if it's you know something that you do every week or every few weeks, um, I think that also just takes it from being this one-off event that you've done to something that you really enjoy um, and something just yeah part of your life. Um, and then, yeah, again, like people have said, a uh, building block to continuing your, uh, your participation and giving back to the community. Yeah, I think connecting students with elected officials is very powerful. And I think there's a sense among a lot of young people, well, they're way up there and they don't want really to hear from us. If you bring them in the room together, you help give them an understanding that they do have civic power. Anissa, tell me about how uh, your coalition, uh, the Baltimore County Junior Council, um, does meaningful work that goes beyond simply kind of service activities that you might not see the outcome of and really pushes it to the next level of advancing change. So we're more of, you know, a student government um, based organization. Um, but one of the things we do is we connect with, so we have um, like every two months we have a general assembly meeting. Um, and so we connect all of the, most of the schools together, um, hopefully all, and, um, you know, give resources to them. And then also it's mainly a platform for all of the participants from every school um, to share what they've been doing and to sort of um, connect their schools with other schools um, so that they can work on accomplishing, you know, a goal together. So one of the ideas that we've had um, that we're looking forward to implementing is sort of having almost like a, we don't really have a name for it yet, but sort of um, having two schools that are connected um, and then every school sort of has a partner school and then um, they sort of keep each other on track and um, keep them accountable to the goals that they've been setting. Um, and I think that kind of leads me to what I was going to say um, to the other question. So I think it um, mainly starts with, you know, just jumping into something and um, finding a way to accomplish something at such a young age. And also like for students to see their small steps and then want to, you know, after having one experience of maybe in school, you know, infused hours or outside of school um, to like 
want to take that initiative to continue something outside of school and then share that with, um, you know, friends or just other people, you know, a neighbor or something so they can work on it together and spread the message of what they're working towards. And then thirdly, I think like a large part of it is setting reachable goals because you can, you can, you know, say, I want to help the environment, but that doesn't mean that you're just going to do one thing and then consider yourself as having helped it. Of course you have helped it, but you know, it's not um, continued. So like the continuation is the main part. And also like acknowledging the initial reason that you, that you started helping this organization or creating an organization of your own. Um, if that's the case is like a large part of it too, because along with like setting reachable goals, like understanding that you, you don't just do one thing and finish, you have to continue it and make it sort of perpetual is the main part of, of service learning. And also, especially at the youngest year. Those are great points. Thank you so much for sharing them. Well, I could continue with my questions, but we have a number of participants here and I would like to now open the floor to anyone who has a question for our panelists. If you have a question, uh, unmute yourself. You can raise your hand. You can use the reactions to show that you've raised your hand and, and I will call on you. We, and you can also put your question in the chat. So let's uh, give the room a second to think about what questions you have. And anyone can ask a question. I'll start if I can. I'm curious to hear from everyone about like what a project you're working on now that you're really excited about that you think is really kind of putting this into action with, with the youth that you're working with. So, um... In our school, so I alluded already to the Project Citizen um, program that we have, which is in third grade, and we love that. And then what we do is we capstone that with the We the People um, simulated congressional hearings in fifth grade, which is great because they've had some experience and they're excited. So then by fifth grade, they're like, all right, let me learn like behind the scenes stuff that I need to know to take my project to the next level. So they do that. Um, and then what we have is in eighth grade, um, many of our schools follow up and do Project Citizen again, um, which so it's, it doesn't stop is the idea, you know. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about is partnering with our um, secondary folks to make sure that the civics um, projects that we have in the elementary school, we don't want them, just as Anissa was saying, we don't want them to just die off, right? We don't want them to feel like one and done, they did it, they helped the environment, great. Now what, right? Um, we want them to keep going and building on it. So um, I'm really excited about the spiraling idea that we have for this to just keep it going because it's it's like everything we do. One and done doesn't really, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay, but we can do so much more. Um, and so that's what I'm really excited about. And the next thing that we're gonna be doing is looking at our pre-K programs. Um, and so looking at beefing that up because just because they can't read doesn't mean they can't understand and think and um, dream. You know, they're our biggest dreamers, honestly. And so getting that started and sparking that, um, that light for them about learning about civics and thinking about things through the um, help others lens, it, they're primed for that at that age. You know, pre-K kids are all about like what's fair and how can I help my my we teach so much about empathy and how do we help others and how does that make others feel and all of that. Like, it's just, it's a perfect opportunity. And with pre-K and Kerwin coming down the pike, like that's pushing pre-K, it's, it's just a natural connection. It makes sense. So starting then in pre-K, making sure, and I would love to have it every year. Um, we just realistically can only have these very large programs that we really support every few years because you know I'm a huge office of two people. So serving you know my 43 schools and making sure we have them be I'd rather them be successful at different times than have it be like hit or miss and just 
um, some students, some schools did it, some schools didn't. No, I want every school of mine, like it's like mandatory. You will do these big projects um, in, in these different grades so I can ensure that every single kid that comes through a Howard County school has had these experiences X many times um, because I need us to reinforce their muscles for civic learning, right? And they're only going to gain those muscles if we keep reinforcing them and we keep having them um, flex those muscles. Great answers. Anyone else have a question right now? This is your last chance before we go to breakout rooms. So take advantage of it. All right, Eliza, can I pop in and answer that last question too? Please do, Lana. Okay, um, yeah, so, so we run a food distribution program, as Eliza said at the beginning, and we're really interested in keeping kids involved in every step of the process and explaining to them why we're doing certain things. Because they're curious, um, they're like little sponges of knowledge. Um, and they, if we explain, it's very easy for even younger kids to understand. So we go through, we're picking up this food from this certain place to reduce food waste. We're packing it in this specific order so that you know, all the vegetables stay super nice and we're not giving people uh, lower quality stuff and we're treating them with respect. We're handing out masa to these families because they're Hispanic and we need to respect sort of their more cultural foods. Um, and then when we're handing it out, we treat people very nicely. Um, and again, just, yeah, treat them like any other person, not like someone that you're like someone else put it earlier, not like someone that you're pitying, but just another member of the community. Um, and so with that, I think we can really keep the kids um, engaged and help them understand like the bigger point of what they're doing um, and how together everyone can make a super huge impact. I love that, Lana. So every step in the process is itself a civic learning activity, not just service learning opens the gateway to civic learning, but that service learning is civic learning because you are behaving in a particular way. You're joining a community, you're being civil. You're thinking about these larger issues. Very, very good answer. Um, good, well, we do have room uh, for more questions, at least one more question. Anyone else? Let's see if someone's put something in the chat. The old golden rule, treat them as you would like to be treated. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> May I ask a question? Please do, Amy. So um, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is the power of role modeling and um, what, like, what is the right way to package that for kids? What's the most powerful for kids? And we did an experiment, or we, there was the kid, oh, that's blurry, weird. Um, I'll put it right by my face. <laughs> it's the um, the Time Magazine did the Kid of the Year, and they have these videos, and they're really powerful. So I brought those to our kids, and I had a sampling of kids look at them and give some feedback. Is this like how was this for you? And kids said these stories were really interesting. They covered a variety of topics, but they're way too far out, and it almost had like it was a kid that had brought food to bazillions of people and they said it's too overwhelming and I can't figure out where to start and it's, it makes me feel like should I even try because these stories are so huge so I'm just curious how have others have um, kind of learned about like thoughts on role modeling in general well I'll jump in briefly you know that really triggers something that you and I I've talked about Amy, which is the way in which sometimes kids are held up as heroes. And, you know, we want to lift up leaders and there isn't as much emphasis as there could and should be on how we're all members of a team. You know, there's kind of like this heroizing, this culture that says it's all about the, it's like the great man theory of history, you know, the, the great man theory of service learning and civic learning. That's really not what it's about at all. It's more about kind of servant leadership and kind of running around to the community and listening and, and hearing what they have to do. Um, so I do think that the way that the media covers this issue or that other people write and talk about this issue 
can have a, a sort of negative impact on how students see themselves and how they act in this sphere. Did I see your hand up, Kim? Okay, yeah. Uh, but I answered, someone else might have an answer for that. And the question was really the role modeling one uh, and how can students see role models that make sense to them? I love that question. And I think that that's gonna be something like you've got my head thinking again um, and I'm going, all right, well, they, if, if we build this program out, we should have lots of examples, right? That they can look at from previous years and go, oh, or what's nice is when they have like an older brother or sister and they can share like what they did and um, have that. The other thing that we do have is we had a, a real problem in Howard County and that we um, were trying to figure out how the constitution would have been different if African-Americans, women, um, yeoman farmers and that kind of, those unheard voices have been at the Constitutional Convention. And we wanted to answer that question, but the resources simply did not exist on an elementary level. Um, like there were lots of primary sources that they could go through, but the number they would have to go through in order to answer that question was astounding and not really feasible um, for the time frame we had. So we threw it out and some eighth graders actually said, well, we could do that. Um, and so, the, they got together with their teacher and they created the resources um, for us. Like they did a research project. And so then that, that program built out and we had all of our eighth grades um, doing that for a few years. And now we have tons of resources, right? So we're like, okay, we need a new project. But it's great because the students could see like from kind of a role model perspective, like, oh, look, they saw a problem and they fixed it. And it was very doable, but it was a very real problem that we had because if we don't start teaching kids about different perspectives from a young age, they're going to grow up with that very whitewashed history that many of us grew up with. And so helping to solve that problem was a great way um, for us to have students, you know, be role models like, look, they took the initiative and then we took their, what they did and we just expanded it because we we're like, it's a great idea. Let's have all kids do that. Amazing. I love that. And it does speak to the power of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, which is a very big thing we do at the Civic Circle. And I want to thank both Lana and Amy for addressing and bringing younger students to address our younger students, because that becomes an opportunity to look up to, say, a middle schooler, a high schooler, or a college student and go, hey, I can be that person. Um, these were great questions and answers. Uh, Zach, if you're here and ready, I think we can go into breakout rooms. I want to thank our breakout room moderators, Trevor Schmutz of the Civic Circle and Marcy Taylor Tama, who has done so much to advance civic learning in Maryland uh, for leading our other breakout room. And I think, Zach, that we can have two breakout rooms and that Trevor can be in one and Marcy can be in the other. Yep, I'm working on it. Just give me Fantastic. a second. I gotta assign everyone manually. Uh, Thank you, you so don't. much. And we, we'll have a little bit shorter time than we thought for the breakout room. No, I guess we'll have about 20 minutes. So that'll be perfect. We'll come back. No, we'll have 15 minutes. We will leave the breakout rooms, Zach, at uh, 1120 so that we can have five minutes to share out. Gotcha. I think 15 minutes is a good amount of time. Okay. So now we assign the remainder here. And all right, Marcy and Trevor are in separate rooms. I'm gonna open them up. Let me know if you have issues. You can come back here. Um, I'm, I'll move around at about 11:20. Give you guys the main room link again, or we can okay. come back here. To yeah, 11:25 actually, Zach is when we go back to the main room. Well, yeah, to I'm go back put to this the main link room. in about. 11, oh, yeah, 11:20 to this main room, and then. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. There you go. The rooms are open. Janet, Gina, and Bethany, you guys okay? You able to navigate the Zoom all right?
Bethany, are you there?
All hey, right. Jack, how are you? I am hanging in there. It's been a busy weekend. Yeah, am I in the right spot? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm double checking, but I'm pretty sure I, I got you on the second one. Yeah, you're the moderator. Yeah. Um, so just so you, Michael, know, and I assume whenever the other people file in, um, actually, Paul's in a breakout room, so that's good to know, um, here. But everyone will come out of their breakout rooms. I'm going to put the main room link in the chat. Obviously, you guys stay put. You're in the right place. We just don't want you guys be confused or nothing. Um, and we're a little early, but that's okay. I kind of figured as much. Sit there, relax, talk to me. I don't know. I don't shut up, so it's now, okay. The 11.30 is the, is the official start time? Uh, 11.35. So you 11 have okay. about 20 minutes to step away, go get a snack or something if you need to. Um, okay, and then you're gonna put us in the the breakout rooms, um, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna facilitate one of them. So, okay, Nathan wasn't able to uh, to stay for. Yeah, I know he had to leave. Yeah. Um, I'll be with Crystal, I think, in breakout room two. Okay. Yes, you're. Yeah, you're listed there. Um, cool. Okay. Well, thank you for doing that. I do appreciate it. I'm oh, gonna try to make. The breakout rooms a little bit more evenly distributed uh a couple people were kind of here but not here and whenever i one of the breakout rooms there's like nine in one and five in the other I'm like, <laughs> ah, crap. But, yeah. um that's okay and yeah. i will be recording this from the get-go because there was a goof up so the first part of small part but the first part is kind of cut out on the recording but there's okay. my admission on tape for lena um but if you have any questions or anything, let me know. Um, Michael, same thing for you. I don't know if you're there to hear me, but obviously. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just uh, outside walking, and I'm sure my audio is really bad, but uh, Sounds yeah, fine I'm here. Me. But uh, you know, good on you getting to enjoy the weather. Well, I guess I do have a question for you, Zach. Um, yeah. I know you were at the meeting yesterday with uh, uh, Jan Eichhorn and the high schoolers. I was wondering if you had like any takeaways. I just wanted to hear what your opinion of it was, because I was there too, but obviously I'd like to hear what you thought of it. Uh, hold on one second, I got a broadcast message. I'll close the breakout rooms in about two minutes, so that way I can answer your question before everyone else comes in and bombards us. Repeat your question for me. I'm sorry. You asked about the high school event. Yeah, I was. I was just asking, like, what you thought of either um, the the guy from Scotland or the high schoolers. Like, if you had any general thoughts. Um. Hmm. I I had disagreements, but I found it quite interesting. Uh, nonetheless, Kieran Kieran's one. Okay. Uh, it was definitely an interesting dialogue, and I, I was glad I got to, to witness it. Um. But, you know, there were some questions, you know, I, and it's kind of blasphemous at this point, but it's like, there, there were some points I'm like, I was in high school not that long ago, and I don't know if I agree with this exactly. Um, not like so much the, 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 the vote, the vote at, votes at 16 presentation, that one was a bit more, the evidence was obviously strong in his uh, presentation. I don't know, the normative arguments haven't. I, I haven't been convinced on that front, but that's a that's a, a different conversation. I think he kind of acknowledged that that's kind of a there's two ways going about this, and he's more of the the quantitative type of side there to address some issues, some concerns, and then I'm more of the normative side. But um, the students did a really good job. There, some of them definitely could speak better in public than I could at that age, probably can now. Um, so that was quite interesting to see. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I tried. Yeah, what, like, what, what did you think was, um, like, what were your disagreements with, was it like the mental health stuff or the college application process? Um, some of the college application stuff sort of confused me because they were bemoaning the academic, the stress on academics, and then they want extracurriculars. 
and then they want like a third thing. And if you don't do all three, okay, hold on, I gotta close the rooms. Uh, close all rooms, close all rooms. Participants will be given 60 seconds to leave their breakout rooms. Um, it seemed like, also, I, I have a law background and foreground ahead of me, so it's kind of, I get nitpicky with words, probably what it was, but um, it was, yeah. they were complaining that it takes so much to go above and beyond, but I, I guess my point is, well, that's that's the point of going above and beyond, is you have to put in that much extra effort, and as someone that did sports and extracurriculars and had a strong GPA, you know, I, it is possible, and it's it does kind of it is a time sink, but it's a it's the time sink. Like that's, that's the trade off you make. I, they were kind of um, upset about that, and then they're also upset about navigating which courses to take. And I'm from Allegheny County, that's where I am currently. We we don't have this smorgasbord of AP classes. We have here's your set. You you can kind of pick one or two. Like there's you can trade out one or two, but by and large, it's if you're going to take AP courses, here are the ones you take this year. And so that's what I thought. Welcome back, everyone from the breakout rooms. Uh, I don't mean to steal Eliza's thunder. I was talking to our next moderators. Um, apologies. Let's go ahead and start debriefing. I don't know if everyone's back yet, but we will go ahead and get started. Yeah, and this is going to be an exercise in brevity is the soul of wit, because we now have exactly one and a half minutes for each breakout room to share out. Thank you. I'm going to ask Anissa to share out for our breakout room. So for the first question, um, which was like, um, do you agree? We sort of like use these as guiding questions and then added to them. So for the first one, um, people were saying like everyone agreed um, and like young kids getting involved and um, also using social studies to teach um, like out of school subjects can be really helpful in like um, including the students' interests in um, what they're learning to do. Um, and someone also said, I wrote this down, the younger, the better, um, and that kids are naturally kind hearted. And for the second question um, about like hooking young children um, into these projects, uh, the main thing was um, creating ideas and um, having a feeling of authenticity. And like with kids having the choice of like doing what they want to do, um, that can also make it really engaging. And also, um, a lot of people were mentioning that reflection is like a fundamental part of the process, because if you're not understanding what you're doing and why you did it, then um, there's like less of a point you're making. And we didn't have as much time for the third question, but um, we talked a lot about like finding the time and making the time to have these activities. But um, towards the end there, the main thing was transportation and um, how the majority of places don't have like activity buses or like um, ways of transportation that are reliable for like routine based activity. Thank you so much. Um, because we have just a few seconds left, I'm gonna say thank you so much to our round table participants and to our breakout room leaders uh, and everyone involved in this panel. And now I'm going to give uh, someone from the other breakout room just a couple minutes to go ahead and say what we talked about. I can speak if nobody else wants to, but I definitely want to welcome the participants if you'd like to. Just in the interest of time, go ahead, Trevor. Okay, so we got into the first question as well. And definitely talked a lot about, and, and this sort of fed into what answers might have come out of the second question, just in terms of one, yes, we definitely think that starting at the elementary level is great and starting young is, is important, um, but really working to adapt what those opportunities are for youth to be appropriate for their age and, and make it possible for them to engage in community service and feel like they're a part of their community, but in a way that is approachable for them. All right. Um, you know, I, I apologize. We had not as much time as we'd like, but we never do with these types of conversations. Um, the link for the main room is in the chat. I want to thank everyone for coming. The password's also there. Uh, 